And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Miltra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the diesel punk epic known as Acro Diesel Age. Uh, with some unfortunate, with some unfortunate um, lookup ish lookup issues comparing to Dan Aykroyd, um, the one and only Leland Anderchek. How are you doing today, man? Hey, doing good, doing good, Mildred. Now, it's a bit of a tradition around here, um, aside from the drinking, obviously, to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. So, with that in mind, walk me through your. Your um first introduction to uh, role playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Uh, to role playing games. Um, now that's a really loose definition because as a as a young as a young youngling, I was much too much of a thick dipshit to be able to read a role playing game book on myself and understand the rules. So like I'd look at them, but this is cool, and I start to read, but they were an armor class, and I'm like, what the the fuck. And I wouldn't understand, like, all the notation and shit, but I would do, like, form-based play-by-post role-playing. Mm -hmm. But I'm not really good at maintaining play-by-post rhythms, right? I'm much more an in-session guy. So it really just oscillated back and forth until my first year of college when I got some people together, and it's like, all right, we're going to play a role-playing game. All right, what are we going to play? And then we show up at the game store, and Numenera looks really cool. And they're like, oh, well, this is the first time. We really recommend this. And then they, like pawn off like one of those like fate starter booklets on us mm -hmm. that we try and do something and then like me and only one other person give a shit about it that person you is now on my channel and by uh my the podcast that ferrata astounding adventures chapter cole did the mixing but um yeah no that just didn't go well which is a part of why anytime someone tries to recommend fate as a starter game i'm like no fate literally slowed my entrance into the hobby by about 12 months i wouldn't get another proper crack at it until i transferred schools and found a 3.5 group where i played 3.5 and i was happy to be there but like even i could tell like this, this was kind of bullshit but you know i don't think it mattered that much for the group and what we were doing but i i was not blown away and then after that my first running was later that year with some of the people running Vampire the Masquerade original. Um, there were some issues there with how I thought about the mechanics and ran it and how some of them were worded in Old World of Darkness what you need to be ready for, mm -hmm. particularly abilities like turning invisible in shadows. Yep. Um, but aside from that, there's uh, I think that's that's the humble origins, really. And uh, I, I really kick off when I run an old-ass game called Space 1889, and I think my proper entrance into designing is when over one winter break, I completely strip out the old combat system for it because it's bullshit, and I keep the exact same stats for all the weapons, but I build a, and like health and everything and all the skills. I don't change anything that's in the book in terms of that and care gen, mm -hmm. but I totally re-plug it in in a new way that just flows better. And I think that's really the transition from a long history of trying to get into just playing games to the first slow, then very swift descent into the, the terrible, terrible fate of an indie designer. <laughs> um, now it's now something I find kind of interesting from what you said, from what you said is not is dissuading the idea of having fate be a um, beginner's game. Um, yeah. Now, the reason I find that interesting is because I keep I keep seeing people swear by, swear by how how fate can be a great game for beginners because of its simplicity. Um, and while I've got my own while I've got my own criticisms when it comes to fate, I'm curious as to why you'd say that it may not be the best option for a first timer. For sure. And I will preface this by saying it depends. If you are playing this for a group of like, if like you're like novelist friend group, for sure go with a game like Fate. 
Absolutely. Play one of those mutual world building games as well. You know, there's all sorts of categories of game that just don't go over well in a majority of groups. I'm, I'm saying a majority there without having a basis for it, but mm-hmm. like a lot of, a lot of the gaming archetypical situations that we know of, you know, with certain types of players, they just don't go over well with a game like that because of how much of it has to be supported by role play. When there's less game there, you lean further on the R and the RPG. And that is something that for an overwhelming majority of the players who I have had personal experience with, that is not something they would have been ready to do out the gate. Not by a long shot. And we weren't, and it got a majority of people there bored and disinterested swiftly. Um, so I think that's that's the core pro- the core sin of fate is it is it is too free, and that is the same thing that, that is the same virtue that people swear by. And I don't think that they're full of shit when they say that it was great for them. I just think that a lot of people talking about what a good beginner RPG should have need to step back and consider that they're in a minority of players, as am I. Designers and Forever DMs are in a minority of players, so I'm in the minority there as well. But I really don't think that people are viewing the whole field when they say that an RP-heavy rules-like game, distinct from just a rules-like game, is the core. I would just oppose it to something like the Year Zero engine. Simple, quick, dramatic resolution, but it's still got a healthy mechanical core. So, yeah, that's that's more or less the distinction that I would draw. I can definitely get be- I can definitely get behind that kind of thing, especially since um, the big problem that I there's two big problems that I've always had with um, fate in its co- in its core senses. Um, the first of the first of them being not making cl- not making clear what makes a good aspect or a bad aspect. Um, and I know I know some people might say, well, well, it's just about it's just about description. Why is why is that an issue? The last thing you want is to have that cer- that certain person who is who um who can't can't put in a decent description for the aspects, and be and because of how closely tied those aspects are to the core mechanics, that ends up creating problems. Um. And I do think I do think writing I do think writing some sort of blurb about what would be a good example, what would be a bad example is possible. I mean, now for the old one unique thing that Thirteenth Age they do that. They have like a two page they have like a two page thing about what's a good example of a of a um one unique thing and what's a not good example and why. Um, yeah, I, pl- I played a session of Thirteen Age. Uh, didn't dislike the mechanics, but yeah, I think I remember that that being a little bit like this seems a little freeform, which wasn't bad, but you know, was a roadblock. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, in the case of one in the case of um Thirteenth Age, it's just that one particular th- particular thing. Um, but there's already enough of a foundation foundation outside of that. Um, the other thing is. During cre- during creation, um, having it having the stunt system be really on a leash. Like if you want more stunts than you get, then you're not going to be able to use um, Fate's version of extra effort as much, which I'm not entirely fond of. Um, most mostly because I d- I don't like I don't like the idea of extra effort being used. Um, in that in that particular ma- in that particular manner, I would much ra- I would much rather have extra effort be its be its own thing instead of something that's going to tie into how big your pool of actions is. Yeah, I mean that is. I'm not super familiar with the stunt economy in Fate, but it is it the mechanics that's more or less state. Hey, you could do this, or you could get access to the cool stuff. Like, if you don't, if that's not well framed within the theme, which is part of the problem with Fate, there is no established theme that or meta setting that informs the rules, like there is in Game of Stars without number. Then it basically comes off as a dick whip nine out of ten times in my experience. 
Well, on the on the other hand, Stars Without Number is made by an absolute genius, so there's that. <laughs> Kevin Crawford, I mean, a, a genius who took how many games to decide? Okay, a, AC can be ascending, but yeah, I mean, I love the best. <laughs> He's great. Yeah, but yeah. Um. All right, and as far as far as the whole AC ascending thing, then there's the interesting version with Godbound, with where it's kind where it's kind of a rule of twenty thing. Oh, yo, I played a game of Godbound recently, and it was funny because, like, I, I really enjoyed it, but it was one of, basically, I'm the Forever DM, and a friend of mine is basically covering for me in the group, and they're running now, and they got dumped into the deep end with all the weirdness of, here's a creature, I'm going to use the word hit die, but it doesn't mean hit die, it just means HP for a mob, here's all of the stuff. Here's how you can variably stat it, and they had to like go through and do all this shit and like what the fuck, and then it fell apart because of course we were all like radically different gods who talked about we were mechanically but not thematically, which is another thing that some games like try to handle. Shadowrun, mm -hmm. you are all shadowrunners. You work together. Why? Because it makes you money. Godbound, you're all pantheon, which was nebulously tie you together, but like that is an extra connect the dot step that nobody. Like, it doesn't really explain it other than you'll be weaker if you walk away from each other, you know? Similarly with Ada, there's no real explanation of why any of the weird people he could be playing are adventuring together. It's left as an exercise to the group. But yeah, if you have players like me uh, who try and, like, go with a certain concept, it can wind up screwing the party concept a little. Or just there was no party concept to begin with. And... Now, to the now, when it comes to the games that you that you've mentioned that you've mentioned, what I'm finding interesting is that they are typically um, die pool type games. Like, and and as a bit of an aside, I always find it amusing when I see people be so dismissive of um, of custom die, and yet I see them playing Fate. <laughs> Yo, yeah, I guess because it's just like they're funky D6s, but yeah. I will say the game that I probably spent the most time with informed Ada was 100% Warhammer Fantasy Role Playing Second Edition. But yeah, um, it's just it's just one of those things I find I find amusing. And um, Fate didn't corner the market on that kind on that kind of die because keep in mind Fate's a um, it started off as this really extensive hack of fudge, which is what those die are. They're based they're they're um, fudge dice. That's where that start. That's where that whole thing started. Um, but going f going from that to Acro Diesel to Acro Diesel Age. Now, first off, where did the idea to do um, a Diesel Punk game come from? This is going to sound really weird because I've been thinking about this myself. Uh, so you, you like you got all right. We're going on a journey here. I really like the aesthetic of metal airships. Like, just like a flying battleship, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know why, I just do. When I see them in like a Final Fantasy type game, I'm like, that's cool shit. I, as a world builder, will s sometimes work backwards from what something, and I'm like, what world instead does this make sense in? And I'm like, well, I guess Diesel Punk. Even though, like, we can debate whether or not Diesel Punk meaningfully exists. I think that not like 1921 plus 1912 plus and like scythe and all that shit. I think that one Polish painter has done more than a lot of, of anybody who named diesel punk to really establish diesel punk as a, mm -hmm. a real thing rather than an aesthetic that exists on deviant art. Right. And, uh, also creating sky captain way back in the day. So. Oh, sky captain. Is, oh yeah. No, that's the movie. Everyone diesel punk community references. Cause I had to hustle in the diesel punk community to get anybody to pay attention to me. And if you look at the other interviews, they're with uh, diesel punk folks, but yeah, no, um, that sky captain will tomorrow, but like that is one movie, right? And one movie does not a genre make. Yeah. So in the process of finding the genre of diesel punk has a whole other question. But to me, it was really more just, I really like the aesthetic of giant, uh, metallic airships. Maybe I'll make a world where they make sense. And I kept drifting in that direction. And I don't really know how that, in my interest in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Second Edition's mechanics, but my, also my gripes with those mechanics, wound up turning into this system. But it did. And I think that that 
question was more that world building question was more or less the genesis of ada and it more or less shakes out to you need very for it to exist on earth like planet you need very advanced technology you did not understand well enough to use for a better purpose that def yeah that definitely makes sense and bring and bringing up um warhammer second edition it was going to tie into where where I was going to ask about the whole use of a D100 system. Um, oh, yeah. So would it be fair to say that it, that your experiences with um, with Warhammer were, part, were the reason for that? There are two kinds of explanations that I give of to people who want to play Ada. There's the kinds of people who've never played one of the Fantasy Flight D100 uh, Warhammer games, and there's those who have. Like, if you've played Dark Heresy or any of that shit, mm -hmm. it does not take you long to start running around shooting bitches in Atta. If you haven't, yeah, we might have to we might have to have a longer explanation, which is one of the Achilles heat one of many Achilles heels of Atta. But yes, the mechanics uh hewing closely is one way to put it. Yeah. And what I do find what I do find interesting with it within this is your is um for, first off having ha having what you're having what you referred to as the caps which having it having it um with that with only um four core attributes that's cer that's certainly a di that's certainly a different spin compared to the um, handful of attributes you have with, um... Oh, whatever. yeah, and, and weapon skill and ballistic skill are two attributes. Yeah, no, attribute bloat was one of the big things that I wanted to cut down on. And when it comes to... When it... And that brings me to that brings me to one thing. When it comes to some... When it comes to the games that you had, that you had played in the past that, um, obviously were... Um, were an influence in either a great or small small way. What were some of the things you wanted to keep, and what were some of the things about those games that you wanted to avoid? Uh, I liked having cool, extensive gear lists. Um, I liked the idea that a weapon's properties and you know unique weapons, particular to a region or a culture, could have different ways that they played. Um, I once played like a Kiss the Vite, whatever they're called, and they have a gun that gets an aim bonus if you take the time to ram your stick into the ground or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. it's a fucking Archibus. Um, little elements like that that you can find all over Ada, perhaps too much over Ada, uh, one could argue. That's the sort of thing that we see is, that I see as a virtue of those systems. And then there's the vice of. Uh, too many attributes and uh, being too weak. Being too weak at the beginning is often, and being too weak at the beginning and too strong by the mid game, quote unquote mid game, is a common problem with the 100 games because the, the question is how do you get people at the middle of the curve and keep them there? Which is something that D20 games do better simply by obfuscating what they are doing far more than a D100 game is. Now what? Now, when it comes to that whole notion of of making players too too weak at the beginning and too and too powerful by the by the midpoint, um, why do you? If you had to hazard a guess, why do you think that ends up being a being a issue? Uh, because, so part of the reason I don't like D twenty games is that I don't automatically think in five percent increments keyed to numbers 1 through 20. And that's what you need to do to make a d20 very instinctually like obvious to you. So it obfuscates it. You're thinking more about the literal numbers than the percentages they represent. I like d100 because my mind immediately grasps, ah, yes, this is its likelihood out of 100 that I am to succeed. Like, is my 2 hit 47? What percentage likelihood is that to hit? Right? And that's that's just that has a strong appeal to me. And the, then, of course, you get the issue of pushing your two hit over one hundred. But 
the I think the problem is the game like Warhammer Fans Will Play Second Edition, you'll have something you're supposedly good at, and your default target number is in the 30s or 40s. That's under 50%. Let's assume you are a D&D creature. You have no proficiency modifier. You have no attribute modifier. You are a fucking commoner with a club. Your target's AC, a shitty AC because they're not wearing any armor and they don't have a positive dex bonus or a negative one, is 10. That's 50-50 odds. You're starting out below the D&D commoner. Now, for the Warhammer world, that makes a lot of sense because that game doesn't start you out as a hero badass. Like there are some careers that sort of lead you to that, mm -hmm. but you're just, like you're a charcoal burner or some shit. Like you are a re you are a basic bitch peasant in a fantasy world where you are a dime a dozen and an orc can slaughter you and your whole family without breaking a sweat, all while like making jokes in a Cockney accent. Yeah. So the implied setting of that world works towards it, but it is still frustrating when you can build a character on being good at something and they eat shit at it nine times out of ten. And you can stack mobbing bonuses for the plus ten uh, like of subsequent other components in melee. You can stack all sorts of other bonuses. You can do whatever you'd like. But ultimately, until you XP up and skill up and grow and grow along the rest of your career shit for other advancement works, but advancement's a whole other issue. I did smorgasbord, just buy what you want, XP style without a... Mm -hmm. Not sure that I, I... I liked the decision to do that, but I would have done a lot of things different to go back. Um, I think that that's the real issue in terms of the... Not the... Uh, like the, the, the progression, right? Where you start off too weak is that people are like, well, we can't start them off too high because then where is there to go? But then they're a little too liberal with peculiar sidelong bonuses, which Ada is as well. There's uh, traits in there that are like way too peculiar as to what they're adding to, like a particular traits for bonuses to call a shot, for example. And that sort of thing, you either subdivide the bonuses too much or you mainline the bonuses too much. Or you allow too many situational modifiers or gear modifiers. Which, I mean, hey, I love situational modifiers and gear modifiers. I love that you can put a scope on your gun and add it, and it increases your attack as long as you're aiming. Because action economy-wise, an add it, aiming eats your whole turn. Half action aim, half action shoot. And I, I like that, and I like that gear is an important component to the world. But... If you don't, and in, that's how Ada sort of bridges that gap, is gear and situation and situational talents and the fact that I let you get really good at something, but maybe not, but definitely not everything. So if you go with the all-rounder, you could kind of feel feel left behind. In a lot of these games, if you go all-rounder with too many attributes, with the games with too many attributes, going all-rounder is a good way to get fucked. Mm -hmm. um, because there's simply, there's too much toast to spread your butter on and add a you got a small piece of toast you can slap and smear that butter on there but the skills are the other half of that gap and because i control where the skill points are spent through the education system uh and i stack further bonuses through the education system primary education areas are plus 10. you don't even need a skill point in there and you're getting functional bonus of a skill point on any skill in that grouping of three right then like, ha like having a high agility can save you on an agility-based test for a skill you're not good at. Mm -hmm. But having a mediocre agility and a mediocre skill there is kind of like, well, I have a 30% likelihood of succeeding on this role. Unless you can stack some sort of bonus, that's not a great odds you're going to hit. But if I start you off much higher, then you're going to progress too quickly. So the question is, how much do you let pr someone progress at once? And Ada is kind of closed-fisted with your progression options in terms of that. But we still see people, uh, like, you know, two or three months into a game who are, or even one month into a game, breaking the 100 limit on their primary skill. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just a common problem of you don't realize how little they're giving you in a D20 system. And you don't see the sliding probabilistic scale in a D20 system. They're there if you examine them, 
But if you're like me, like you examine it, but then it goes out of your head when you're not actively trying to design or think about it in that regards. For D100, you need to be able to take that mindset and reapply it because it's more obvious. It's not like you're interacting with an arcane hidden system. You have a very raw mechanic there. This is your percentage likelihood out of 100 to succeed. It is not obfuscated behind what kind of dice I am asking you to roll. It is not, ob like, I'm not saying roll XD6. I'm not saying do this or that, which are understa immediately understandable concepts to people. D100, I'm literally saying, like, calculate your percentage likelihood and roll to see if that's what happens. So it's a very raw mechanic in that fashion, and I think that myself and many other D100 designers have perhaps not done it justice in its implementation. We have simply let ourselves rock on the fact that it is a very potent mechanic and a very accessible mechanic mm -hmm. and maybe didn't do all the legwork we should have on making sure that it was refined. It was a diamond. It's a diamond in the rough. You still need to like buff it out and take like the minerals and shit off the side. Oh yeah. Now when it came now um when it came to when it came to it's the thing about something like Warhammer Second, um, when it comes to its combat is the degree of lethality with it. I mean, af after all, even somebody who's on the high end of the spectrum, they're only gonna have maybe a dozen wounds to their name oh, before, yeah. before they end up starting to do the utter hell that is critical hit tables. Um when it can't now Obvious, obviously, the type of the type of technology and the type of equipment that's gonna that's in ADA compared to Warhammer is night and day. But were you aiming for a similar level of lethality, or or um, was that not was that not the intent? Because I think that I think that's a good segue considering the whole um, balancing thing that we mentioned earlier. For sure. Um, yeah, I was aiming for a similar level of lethality. I'm a bit of a punch puller as a DM. Like, I don't like to kill people's characters. I just don't like to do it. Um, particularly in, like, a, the context of a long-running campaign. Particularly when there's no dramatic reason for it. And Ada, there won't be a dramatic reason for it. Because more or less, the way the math works out is that if you go in clean at your average 12 to 14 vitality, 3 resistance, which is your innate DR in Ada, um... You will probably survive one shot unless somebody has like a sniper rifle and they get a good hit. But by the time you've been tagged about once in Ada, now you're really looking bad. And in some ways, it's better that someone gets laid out immediately because then people are like taking them out of the fight. They're not being seen as a threat. Because in Ada, it's. I thought long and hard about making a critical hit table for Ada because that was one of the, my favorite aspects of the Warhammer system. And I couldn't really tell you the ultimate reasoning for why I didn't. But the long story short here is if you go below negative five vitality, you die. Obviously, the Dreamweaver can fudge that, but that's that, them's the rules. That's raw Ada. And it is a very lethal system, and there is no innate a vitality growth you have your hp and if and you can spend xp on growing it but not infinitely and strength a subsequent ups to your strength will give you slightly more and it will give you more damage resistance but it won't save you additionally there's your mental health there's psyche and there is a result that's just like your character is basically no longer yours it's like a one in 100 but there's lots of negative impacts that can come from being psychically, psychologically broken. If they happen in the middle of a fight, that could spell the doom for your whole group. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I built it and build it as a lethal game, even though I'm not really a lethal DM. A bit of a weird juxtaposition. But uh, it is definitely a game of like scrappy bum fight melee combined with a lot of gun tactical gunplay. So the idea is if you stand out in a field and let your enemy aim at you with their gun you're going to have a bad time. So maybe get behind cover, which starts to stack negatives on people trying to shoot you, and to maybe outflank them to negate their cover, and maybe use a, a grenade or throw something at them or do something else, or have a melee wrecker who comes in and flushes them out or puts the beat down on them. Like, there's a variety of ways to do it, 
but uh, I think that there's a lot of games that functionally occur in a generic 30 by 30 foot room where there's nothing of tactical interest in it. And if that's how you run a game and you go to run Ada, you're gonna have you're gonna stack a lot of bodies pretty quickly. If it's just two sides mowing each other down with weapons, a lot of people are gonna fucking die. And Ada's gear, because it is a DR system, right? Uh, when you get better gear, it can up your survivability massively. But uh, there's always still risks. Yeah. Now, one of the th one of the things that was that was curious about that was curious about since um, it ends up getting its own, it ends up getting its own system within the book within the book is um, the concept of light lances. Um, how yes. How how did that come about? Was it was it just a case of one of one, like how like how you you um saw the saw the um say say airship in in one of the Final Fantasy games and that and that provided an impetus or was there a different um, background? So the light uh, like all the mecha and stuff uh, definitely it, it flowed from the Weird War two angle that I saw some people kind of do, but never in my mind fully commit to. For some, particularly war games will try it, and some RTSs will try it. And I like that aspect. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, I like I like I liked it. Like I came out like this idea and like of like this stuff with Ada. I started writing before Scythe even came out, before most people knew about 1912 plus. But like when I saw Scythe and people liking I'm definitely like this is a a recognition of the concept that I'm going for here, that people will like these ideas. And um, I guess I was further reiterated with stuff like Fallout 4 and the power armor, because light lances are basically power armor to the point where in Fallout, that's how I run power armor as a light lance. Um, but yeah, no, I think weirdly, once I was out in the diesel punk aesthetic, I got in my mind that I was going to make a defining work of a, a setting that is going to be a defining centerpiece of this nascent, not quite yet born genre that is diesel punk. Because the aesthetic diesel punk already exists. But the genre, I mean, yeah, you've got Sky Captain World to Tomorrow, and then you got to start grasping at straws and like making leaps and bounds. Because trust me, I've looked deep to find examples of diesel punk. I think the and, like, problem, they're there, I think the problem but... is when it comes to trying to find examples of diesel punk is that so much of it ends up bleeding into steampunk. Yeah, and that's really the question of like what like what's the difference? And the most common answer is that the era is like you go up basically through the Victorian era and World War and like beginning World War One with uh, steampunk, and World War One to the interbellum period to World War Two, and that period's view of the future informs diesel punk, which is something that I kind of embrace. But ultimately, I didn't really give a shit about that when I was making Ada. What I really gave a shit about was. I don't know, like this vague concept of diesel punk that I'd come to after deciding that flying battleships are cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, inspirationally, they did come from a, they came from a place of, I like this is the kind of world that they live in. Diesel punk involves mechs, mm -hmm. involves like these dirty diesel powered mechs. And for reference, like for those of you who don't know, watching at home, diesel in the acro diesel age is not what it is to us. But you know. Because, yeah, it would not be practical at all to run a Mac uh, on diesel. You would not have enough space for fuel. But overall, I think that it uh, I think it worked out well in the mechanics and the lore. Because it's basically a... It's kind of like an, AP, an, un, like an APC that can't carry people on legs. Like, it's the Vic that you walk behind, but it can go into buildings. It is your mobile cover weapons platform. And given how, given how given how, how I've done how I've done crazy stuff in the in in some of my past games, like give some like give somebody a a um a giant tower shield that could that could that could um double as a mo as a mobile turret. Um, I'm perfectly fine with that, even if he even if he kept screwing up how the thing was supposed to be used. 
<laughs> it's a bit it's a bit of a running gag because he kept he kept throwing the shield like he was Captain America and ended up Oof. and ended up being <laughs> Ended up being the whip, the campaign's whipping boy for months after that. Didn't help that the dice gods didn't like him. Then again, the Sometimes. dice gods don't like anybody. Sometimes you just need to eat. Mm-hmm. Um. Now, when it now, when it comes to the when it came when it came to the uh, concept of vehicle chases. Now, obviously, that's something that's. Well, it's certainly possible in, in stuff like War in stuff like um, Warhammer. It's um, in fa- in fantasy roleplay. It's it it wasn't ever it wasn't really emphasized. And um, yeah, because I mean, like it's either going to be boats or like a cart race in uh, yeah. in that. I think the o- I think the only time I ever I ever used it, and it was invo- was involving a ca- involving a campaign with um. With my own, I wanted to do a. The whole idea was I wanted to do a fantasy version of steel of um, of steel ball run. <laughs> nice. Just with just with one one giant cross country horse race. With a, with everybody armed, of course, because well, I played wait I played Mario Kart way too much. <laughs> don't wor- don't worry. There was no fantasy version of a blue shell. That's 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 relieving. <laughs> that would be a pretty OP attack. Um, yeah, give, and while while um, so, while there were certain mages that were in that were in the race, um, the problem is it's really it's really hard to concentrate on spell casting when you're on when you're on a horse going full speed. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, that's uh, the, the whole like what what allows you to what, what takes your concentration is a whole question that is left in, up to the DM mm-hmm. in that game, D and D at least. Um, but when but, and of course the the um the for, the Fantasy Flight Forty K games had had eventually done ve- done vehicles, but it was. It was an add-on thing, like it wasn't in. It wasn't in um, core. Yeah, except for I think uh, second edition Dark Heresy, um, and I remember they had really nice paper dolls, uh, like the cutouts showing you know, like the stats and like the armor and stuff. And I, I was like, wow, I should shoot for that, and then I never did. You know, there's oh, spreadsheets for Ada. Yeah. Um, now, when it came to when it came to the the idea of doing. Vehicle vehicle chases and vehicular combat was what was the um goal, what was the motif that you were trying that you were trying to shoot for with how that was designed? How it was designed, like mechanically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, more or less, the idea was that the vehicle was kind of like a character because I was not imagining like I was imagining each party was going to have like one vehicle that they were actively using at a time. And at some point, I got a little uh, too deep and sort of took a simulationist angle on it where I'm like, I want to describe all the vehicles that exist in the world for whatever purposes someone might have for them. You see with the Europa burning splat that there is uh, a lot of, like, random military vehicles and shit. Um, But I sort of decided that if they were going to be in the world, they needed to be done to a certain lo- a level of rigor that would allow shenanigans to flow from their existence. Like, they have subsequ- they have little parts that can break, and there's a special critical hit table for vehicles that can cause bad shit to happen with them, like fires break out, or they the engine blows out, or whatever. Or they can't turn so good. Or your brakes get destroyed. Yeah. Especially, especially, especially given... Given the sort of en- given the sort of engine work that you're dealing with in well a diesel punk setting, um, but there were there were there there were some aspects of the of the uh, technology that I was a bit curious as to as to your reasoning why, why that was um, implemented and the big one for me of course is morphs. Indeed. 
because I could see more, I could see morphs being argued as a more um, as a more biopunk kind of thing since you basically are mess messing around with somebody's genetics. Um, was it was it something that was inspired by the um, mutations that were that were in Warhammer or was there a different approach? Oh, I definitely think so. Like, I definitely think that it was. And the thing is, I also kind of like the idea of like, like mutants in a post-apocalyptic, post-post-apocalyptic environment, right? And how they would be treated and how they would negotiate society. Or navigate society, negotiate society. Um, but the question became, but like, I don't have magical nuclear, like if you, if like, there's not really nuclear radiation in Ada, but in the rare places you find it, it just gives you cancer. Like, and maybe your hair falls out if you get too much. It's not, it's not going to make you magic, right? So I wanted to get there, and I'm like, well, society more or less briefly existed in, a sem in like a borderline transhumanist ascendancy, right? Mm -hmm. Before the green fall. And if they had the technology necessary to make the green fall happen, where like most life on Earth got turned into slurry, then there's gotta be like there's they, they, I all you there's extensive gene modification going on at the time. There's extensive uh, genome altering at first. It's designer babies. By the time of the apocalypse, it's uh, like bloodstream uptake more or less. Like you can CRISPR yourself, and your hair will change color and shit like that. And the, uh, the, the, so the morphs are a bit of a stretch in terms of what someone might air quotes reasonably expect to exist in a society like that. But to me, it wasn't such a far fetched thing that a biotechnology firm that is far fetched, but you know, it was still in setting that a biotech firm would come up with this alternate method of gene transfusion. And it would have some more or less unintended consequences after they got loose because you know, it's, you don't have to go in for therapy and you can like, must breed more of them, and it would be one of the only life forms that would just be completely resistant to the green fall and just wouldn't be wiped away because it's an artificial life form. Like someone designed every aspect of the Morphans biology in a lab. They are not an evolved species, so that gives them wide freedom. And it, I, it also means that someone like a random redneck with like a breeding vat can be like, hey there, Sonny, are you looking for a third eye? And I kind of enjoyed that aesthetic. Yeah. Of like, this is something that people have, this weird, limited, semi-control, semi-not control over, is also just like a passive threat in the world. Because I did want, I wanted to explain, why do people cling to these cities? Because the population isn't high enough that this is just like the natural urban density. People are staying here for a reason. And part of the reason is, like, the cities are mostly cleared out of, like, wild... Like, this, the pop-based cities are cleared out of the random Morphants and other shit that exists in the capital W wilds. There are just a lot of hazards to living out there, and they were going to be one of them. And they were going to be one of the consequences of not living in a safer environment. And also living with the wreckage of the past world. Because I don't have things like nuclear radiation to be, like... Uh, hey, maybe humanity uh, made some interesting decisions in the past that are now fucking you. So I did it in a few different ways. Because mostly old technology and shit is good and you want it in Ada. Yeah. And that brings me to the whole concept of a post-post-apocalypse. Because if, if, the, if, getting, if getting material for, um, for diesel punk is hard, I'd say... Getting, I'd say, material for the for the idea of a post post apocalypse is ju is just as tricky. In fact, I think, I think the only I think the only games that I've covered in 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 my series that fall into that category are Fragged Empire and Degenesis. Ah, uh, Degenesis. I'd argue Degenesis is still an apocalypse. Um, yes. Now, your definition of this might vary, but the way I've always seen it. A post-post-apocalypse is where enough time has passed between between um between the present time of the, time of the setting and when the proverbial bomb dropped, even if it wasn't a bomb, that new um societies, new civilizations, new nations, what have you, have ri have risen up. 
Um, that's fair. And that's the reason why I. That's the reason why I disqualify something like, say, Fallout. Um, because even though the, even though there's places like the Institute or the or the Enclave, or the NCR and so on, um, a lot of the a lot of them are either um tri- are either tribal effects, or or still very much rooted in the old days. Yeah, with the NCR they. There's some dialogue implying that like they're gonna run out of medical and food supplies because they can't keep looting and sustaining their population base if they don't find out how to move forward. I'd argue that a game set 100 years past Fallout 4 in the NCR would probably be post post apocalyptic or just apocalyptic because the NCR fell apart. Mm-hmm. Depending on what you think of the fate of that particular misadventure. Although, although, get, although, although, since you brought it. Since you brought that up, now I'm thinking. Now I'm thinking of new. Ve- now I'm thinking of New Vegas, and now I'm salty yeah. again because of how Obsidian got fucked over with that whole thing. I know, but yeah, the uh, the I will say this: I once read an article that I immediately disagreed with, and have only come to agree with more over time. Which saying you know is good. I don't know who this guy is, but he's some game designer, and he basically wrote every role playing game is set after an apocalypse. I don't agree with that. But I think that he has a lot more weight than I initially gave it because he laid out a few basic things that are true in the vast majority of role playing games. And he was coming from very much the tradition of role playing games are where you go into a dungeon and kill things and take loot. Um, He's like, well, there has to be loot that people can't just build anymore to be worth going into a dangerous ruin full of things they don't quite understand to scavenge, yeah. which immediately implies so many things about the setting that unless your setting is very deliberately come up with a different way to explain that, that probably means you're picking through the ruins of a ruined civilization. I'd, I'd, argue, that, I'd argue that that sort of thing is less of an artifact of, um, of apocalypses and more, uh, and more of um, a reflection of... of of what of how of how people treated Rome after Rome fell, for instance. Oh yeah, well that's that's one of the things that I say about Adam. I describe it. I was like, Rome was an apocalypse in the same sense as the Green Fall was an apocalypse. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Green Fall cost way more lives, but like civilization, like people survived and civilization got back on its feet. But it took them a very long time to return to the level that had been achieved. Yeah, and. When and of course, when it comes to something like Fragged Empire, that particular affair ha- happens w- happens so f- happens so far um, after the fact that the that um the original types of humans are no are no longer around. Um, and to th- and when it comes when it comes to that, what was the reasoning that you went with a post post apocalypse? For the for um for ADA, I think it can comes back to the question weirdly of airships. I don't know why airships do not play that vital a role in what the average ADA player does, right? But I think the concept does come back to the airships, and uh, and I was just sort of like riffing and coming up with random shit. And I think somewhere in that genesis, because when I get going on world building, I just get going. Some wild stuff happens, but I think the genesis comes back to. Where do these things come from? Why are they being built? And so I put it on Earth, even though I love to create wholly original settings, because, you know, if I'm going to change something, you kind of want a familiar basis to it. If, if part of the emphasis is going to be on what life was like here before. Because if it's just a fantasy world, nobody knows, which can be an advantage if you just don't want the players to go in not knowing. But there's a certain added oomph when it is the real world. And... Then I need to get society and civilization and history to a point where this shit happens. And I didn't want to do an alternate history. I wanted to progress the timeline. I thought it would be more interesting. I didn't want to do World War II again. I, I thought that that had been overdone. And I thought that the very simplistic uh, views of the ideologies of playing World War II was not that we see a lot of these punk fiction was not what I wanted to go for. So what you see in the war going on in Ada is literally like a war between democratic nations on either side. And it's not about idiot. 
who's going to be in charge. And it's about commerce and greed and various people who will benefit from this war and who want to make other people suffer from this war, largely like financially in terms of international influence. And also greed and people sticking their dick where they shouldn't have without fully knowing what was going to happen. And I think that that's, yeah, that, that, so that's, that brings me to why I want to put in the future. I wanted to completely control, like I wanted to be able to be wrong about everything, to have everything be different and to have the ultimate trump card of this year 2714. Shit has changed. And to really be able to make like a, a culture that feels a little bit foreign in a familiar setting. And I can, I can, um, I can definitely get behind. I can definitely get behind that particular thing. Although, um, based on some of the things you you've said, I get, I get the feeling you'd be more willing to run a World War One campaign than a World War Two campaign. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Ada is supposed to be. It was supposed to be a World War One type war going on in Europa, mm -hmm. but it's actually, I kind of wound up making more of a Franco-Prussian war. Which, but yeah. Is um is is not bad is not bad company to be in. Now, when it comes to now, um, I realize I realize your work, I realize your um your work you're working on other things now. But when it comes to when it comes to a retrospective look at ADA, what were what were some of the things that you feel that you feel like you got right, and what were some of the things you feel like uh, you could you could have um you could have gone back and and adjusted a bit. Priority. Nobody needs to worry about. Let's see, is supposed to be more old timey. So, like you know. 25 cents is supposed to be worth money. Mm -hmm. um, and then, the, like, one of the other things that I would change is, I mean, a lot of the issues I have with uh, Ada had more to do with presentation and marketing, but mechanically and story-wise, like, I think that I need to lay it out in a more accessible way, and I think that I needed to probably probably like build something that was more I went state by state down the east coast and I think that I need to get once more broad and more specific and maybe in like subsequent releases rather than just like the whole core rule book but I do think that it was a benefit and a hazard because I wound up with all these cool little interesting locations that I really want to talk about but not that much space to do it in. And it can be kind of baffling if you roll up an origin someplace and then you see the, uh, you know, the city of Rhodes and you're like, well, what's going on in Rhodes? And it's got its whole own culture and shit going down. Like that, like the state of Rhode Island is a, a city and its culture is not at all like what was there before. But in terms of what I liked about the, let's go with character generation. Yeah. Uh, I've I've gone back and forth on whether or not you should roll stats. Um, I'm no longer a big fan of rolling stats, but I do leave it as a character generation method. Uh, I think that I needed to give more freedom in how the background was constructed rather than building like over a hundred origins and multiple backgrounds. I think I needed to make a more rewarding yet simpler system of like smorgasbord style select what you're going to get out of your origin, your background, so it could be generified, so I didn't need to go country by country, state by state, city by city, giving backgrounds for each. Or origins, rather. The origin and background distinction is something that I probably should have trimmed up and could have been gotten rid of. Uh, background is the idea of, like, what were you doing recently? Like, what was your past career? And origin is, like, literally, what, where are you from and what skills and traits did you acquire while you were there? Are you from the country? Are you from a city? Etc. Etc. Mm -hmm. So I think going overly specific 
uh, was a weakness in some of my carriage uh, mechanics. It does create a very unique character generation process, but overall a somewhat cumbersome one for what it is. Yeah. And yeah. I would also try and free up character direction to let people, because right now in Ada, people basically have to be a specialist. You can be a specialist in something and do it quite well, but you'll probably be shit at everything else to begin with, at least. Mm hmm. Or you can try and go with an all-rounder. I think I would do more things to incentivize being an all-rounder and making it easier. And I would also slow up the progression a few ways in terms of the XP, the traits you can buy. Because traits are basically the entirety of progression in Ada. You buy a trait that gives you more stats. You buy a trait that gets you more vitality. You buy a trait that uh, gives you plus 20s or plus 30s in this one scenario. That sort of thing. I think that I would... Uh, go over the math on how I hand out XP and the numbers because... A lot of times, like a cheaper trait won't really only really matter that you're able to spend 25 or 50 on something due to the price jumps. It's a bit much to get into, but the point is, and also there's not really a tree progression. I want there to be a trait tree progression. And how much trouble even I have sometimes deciding how to use the skills. Mm -hmm. and I think we need an overhaul of the skill system. And that means a 2.0 to me. Uh, like, like, no longer for forward portable. We'd be crossing the Rubicon there. And I think that aside from that, I'd probably want to go back and... Is like everything, like the, the cook buffed up. Hmm. Holy shit. Why is there a system where you can regenerate more food and psyche if you eat across the food groups? Who is going to do that? Who's tracking that? I think part of the issue is that I had originally like started building this game, conceiving it of it as very scavenging focused. And that's not really how I proceeded to run any of the Ada games. So I imagined a scrappy life of like the people on the edges of civilization salvaging and having to keep their shit from falling apart because it's all kind of crappy. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I would go back and change how condition progresses, the, the, dur the durability system in the game. Uh, there's a rule for armor degradation that basically never gets used because it would be held to track and make armor kind of worthless. I would also go back and revisit the innate DR and the fact that there's two types of special eye, like this penetration. Sorry about the te sorry about the tech issues, folks. Hey, you back? I am sorry. Sorry about that, man. Okay. Um, but yeah, so the psyche is your press your luck mechanic, where you can take a D four hits to your own psyche, mm -hmm. and then you'll get to re-roll. But only if it's in your primary educational area. Which means you can only re-roll if it's something you're already specialized in. I think that that was a bad design choice on my part. Often the push your luck mechanics are better suited to the stuff that people are mid-grade at anyway. So I would, just, I would branch out the push your luck mechanics and the use of Psyche. And I would have more things damage Psyche and more things heal Psyche. Because right now it's basically just like a re-roll meter. But then automatic fire grenades take it down, but... 
people just get shot at by automatic weapons and get grenades thrown at them less than I would expect outside of warfare in particular scenarios playing at them. Social combat was also a great thing that I did, but uh, it's kind of a mess in the current iteration of Ada, and how it works out doesn't really make sense, so I think it needs a revisiting, which is something that I'm working on kind of in prototype with Red Knight and Dickering, where you more or less do deals with demons, to eat them, yeah. shit like that. So, And one of the core flaws of old social combat was also lots of people had nothing to do, and lots of people don't have, like, there's only there's only two primary social combat combatants. Only one party member can be the primary social combatant. So I would revisit the social combat system. I'm glad it was there, but I would I do want to re-emphasize the non-violent mechanic re uh, resolution options as an option. I know there's a school of thought that says all of that should be left to the role play. Uh, there is some merit to that, but I do think that mechanics have a place. Aside from that. You know, I think that the games. I think that the games. Uh, general weakness was that a lot of the mechanics were too particular and not well integrated enough into the mechanical whole. Because I was more or less just sort of flying by the seat of my pants as I designed the game, rather than starting out with a structured whole uh, and think about how everything flows into everything like I might today. Yeah. I so I think that. I could definitely see that. Um, there is a, there's always a bit of a unification issue um, in some games. Right, and you, uh, it's kind of like you can tell how close they were to cutting the mechanic. Be because of how many things reference that mechanic. Mm -hmm. Like, not a lot of things reference. Endurance. Not a lot of things reference encumbrance in 5e. Not a lot of things reference uh, hit dice in 5e. Well, there are. Fi well, 5e is a um. <laughs> that that's a that's a whole that's a whole, can, that's a whole can of worms when it com when it comes to when it comes to it when it comes to its design quirks. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it comes. To, it's a good example, though, almost a cautionary tale of what happens when you are overburdened by a legacy. And they are actually burdened by it. But I think a lot of designers like myself allow ourselves to become psychologically burdened by the idea of, well, I can't change this sunk cost fallacy or whatever. But remember, you're not you're not wizards. You don't have um, some fucking Hasbro property to shepherd. The vast majority of people aren't going to know or care. Your friends and playtesters will be like, ah, oh, what, we have to relearn how this one mechanic works? But you might as fucking well if it's gonna if it has a chance of making the game better in the end. Mm -hmm. And as long as you keep a saved copy, there's nothing stopping you from reverting. Yeah. And, of... and I've um I've talked I've talked about D and D's tradition problem many many times over over the years. And spoiler warning. I heard you start problem. talking, but I think you cut out on my end. Um. I think I think I'm good. Um, I had a bit. I had a couple ping issues earlier, but I think we're good. I think we're good right now. Oh, never mind. There it goes. Ah, there we go. Sorry about hey. that. I have no idea why that why that keep why that keeps happening. Um, and I'll pro I'll probably end up talking about the tradition problem in the in the future because um, I know a lot of people like to like to think that th that this is something that w that um that that Hasbro or Wizards can be blamed on. Uh, not real, not really, in my opinion. I think the sh I think they just accelerated the problem. It, I, I mean, I think it's the it's the I think it's the players and like the fans and the community because. More or less, they have proven that they will punish. Like, the like 5e wasn't designed to be the new player's edition. It was designed to be the nostalgia-baiting edition. And so the mechanics had to, on the surface, ape the old editions. And they were there were things literally put in the game and left in the game purely 
for the sake of baiting old fans. Which, if that, which, if that's the case, some. Um, if if the if the if the intent was to try and bait old fans, um, I liken it to to um to a ki- to a kid telling their parents that they want that they wanted a that they want a Disney princess doll, and they end up getting a Princess Leia fi- figure for Christmas. You're technically correct, but you kind of missed the point. Indeed, um. I think that there's a, yeah, there's a lot to be said there, but I probably shouldn't drive the conversation mm-hmm. to five E. Uh, yeah. So where were we? Yeah. It, when it came to, when it came to um th- things to improve when it came when it came to ADA and the I had mentioned the whole um concept concept of unification, which admittedly is a ha- is I've a, lost you again. Oh god damn it. Um. Admittedly, the and here we go with the ping bullshit again. Oh, oh I hear you. Back. Okay, um, unific. It was on the matter of unification, um, because when it comes when it comes to when it comes to mecha- when it comes to core mechanics, I I have a very all roads should lead to Rome approach, um. It's not to say mm. every. That's not to say it sh- that the same mechanic should be used all the time, but more of if you have if you have a core mechanic, then everything should lead back to that in one form or another. Yeah, uh, and that also is the, the. But there's a difference between mechanic and resolution, mm. uh, like system, because some designers are like. Well, this means I'm going to have everything just like I'll call for a die roll every time you want to do anything. Like, no, you can go ahead and let some things happen. Not everything should be the chance of failure yeah, under normal conditions, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, you shouldn't have to roll to put some, something in your backpack or whatever. Encumbrance systems would not be made better by having to roll for them. But uh, unless your ga- the point of your game is that people get tired when they have a lot of things in the backpack, which, fair. But yeah, I think that unification of mechanics is tricky, but I do think that making sure everything ties back into the core loop is key. And the tighter you make the focus of your game, the easier you can determine what that core loop is, and you can give it spice and flavor on the sides that all feed back into the same general milieu. Comma, however, if you want to, I didn't want to make a game that was focused on like just salvagers or just aristocrats or just war. I wanted to make a game which could fully encapsulate the world of the Acrodiesel Age, which I think you can make a game to do, but I'm not sure the game that I made did that well. I think the game I made had suggestions of several bespoke, unique individual games within it. And ultimately, that is both his vice and his virtue. You can do a lot of different things in Ada. It is a robust system in some regards. Mm-hmm but it is not a strongly linked system in other regards because there is not a coherent design philosophy that touches every element and ties them all together. Yeah. Um, not which for what, for what it's worth, that whole, that, that very simulationist style approach of, of trying to do a company for, for every aspect is, um, is something that's fallen out of favor in the last 20 years. Certainly, oh. because I, I would argue because it is simpler and easier to make, market, and sell a tight concept game. Now, with that with that in mind, what um, what pro- what projects are you what projects are you do, are you currently working on? What do you've got? What do you what are you um, planning for down the pipeline because you did mention um, working on a few things. Yeah, so I, I heard the second half of that, but you're asking what I'm doing next. Yeah. All right. Well, so I mean, I stream weekly on twitch.tv slash Diesel Shot, and uh, right now we're working on a sci-fi setting called Change Stars that my creative partner Pat has come up with, 
and we've played it with the Alien RPG for a while, and we're going to transition into giving it its own system soon. I'm also working on Thursdays is normally uh, our Fallout game, Uranium Fever, which uses Ada, which has sort of highlighted some of my issues with it because, like, I'm really forced to face them every week. But overall, I just think the system does a good job. That's why we keep using it. Mm-hmm. Then there's, right now on Thursdays, Red Knight, which is a... If you ever played the Persona or Shin Megami Tensei games, which I actually haven't, a lot like that, and this idea of you're in the real world, but then midnight strikes and there's this extra hour out of time between midnight and midnight 01. Mm-hmm. And if you're waking, you can see angels and demons and profane spirits and then either dicker with them or beat them up to consume or assume their spirits into your souls. And the progression system is literally you're playing a puzzle game like Tetris, flipping soul blocks and slamming them into your soul to bejewel defy your emotions and shit mm-hmm. and spiritual powers. Um... Then pick a dominant emotion out of eight on Plutchuk's Wheel of Emotions. Boom. Done. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the character generation process. So, yeah, that's more or less what I'm working towards in terms of simplicity and ease of flow. For an out of 2.0, it's always going to take you longer to make a character, but I do want it to be a little bit quicker. And aside from that, I think that the uh, I'm basically going to keep I I stream very regularly. As for my role playing game output, hasn't quite been as robust over the years since Ada. Maybe in part because Ada just didn't really reach a good reception. I sold like twenty copies, but I do think that in the future, as I link my development. Two streams, you're just going to see more of my content. And of course, if you like DD, I also stream higher on Mondays. Mm-hmm. I'm my own bespoke German Japanese fusion setting. Uh, it's kind of inspired by Birthright, but like my take on a better way to do that. So, yeah, I don't think that uh, there's anything else that I have in the pipe, so to speak. But, you know, I'm quad core on Twitter, Q U A D K O R P S. And I'm uh, looking forward to getting back into the indie creator scene in terms of RPGs and just sort of putting things out and ruminating on how best to do an add a second edition because I do think it's a game that could really benefit from one. Yeah, no, and of course I'll be keeping an eye out on how on how that's go- on how that's going to play on how that's going to play out as I always do. And to that end. I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to um, come on to the show and enjoy the insanity. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As we often say, sure. here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'll definitely uh, show you at night and see if you're interested. And then maybe if it uh, gets to a more developed stage, I can come back and talk about it. All right. All right, I will. I will definitely. I will definitely keep an eye out on that, and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the the madness, and there will be more where that came from, as as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.